from Cali. I do personal training in mostly San Francisco, trying to move on over to Oakland. Thanks. You. Oakland. <laughs> so, you know, if you have any clients that are in Oakland. Um, I started doing a lot of research on hypermobility a little bit, obviously, self <laughs> for myself. Uh, but also just because I was recognizing that a lot of the population that I was seeing, a lot of hypermobile folks, there is no, no like guidance of what to do past physical therapy. There's like the exercise, what to do, and what are the best practices for this population. So that's kind of why I put this together. Uh, so with you guys, how many do you work with any hypermobiles? Agenda, uh, right? Okay, like one to three or about, or like more than five? Yeah, okay. Um, contortionist, gymnast, or just Actually, like the parkour like the people folks? people or dancers who didn't even know that I have to move. Right, okay, good. Flip it, you know so even if you don't have hypermobiles, we're still talking about humans, right? It's still a lot of my, and because actually there's not a whole lot of research on specifically on hypermobiles, so a lot of what I try to do is sort of based on the science that, and how tissue works with just normal folks. And they, the little research that they've done, we're hoping that you know if you get tendons stronger in the normal folk, we might not be able to build collagen exactly you know, up to the nice structural integrity that a normal person would, but we can hopefully at least advance it and get it stronger to an extent. So, um, so it should hopefully be helpful, helpful information even if you don't have hypermobile folks. So. So you have your hypermobile client, or you have three different hypermobile clients. Are they all the same? Probably not, <laughs> very <laughs> unlikely. There is huge variability in the hypermobile community because, next slide, it is a spectrum condition, okay? What does everyone know when we say, oh, you're on the spectrum? What are we talking about? Autism. Autism. Usually, <laughs> everyone knows about autism, possibly because it's, it's more prevalent in boys. But, um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, don't forget about men. <laughs> men and boys. Um, so, it is a spectrum condition. What does that mean? Spectrum just means huge variability in how it presents the phenotype, what we see when someone has any sort of disorder or condition, especially on anything that's on a spectrum, okay? So hypermobility spectrum disorders is the fancy term that they came up for, including all of these people, even outside something that, the clinical diagnostic term is called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, okay? So someone may be diagnosed, you may have someone that has been diagnosed, the diagnosis is forever, it takes like six months to a year. A lot of folks don't go through this diagnostic, diagnostic, diagnostic uh, process. Um, but you can have low functioning. I've seen a smattering of these people. It's really hard to get them out of the PT realm. Um, I had one, she was like, I'm in pain after standing for five minutes. So mm -hmm. that's how low functioning. Most of them are disabled. They don't have jobs because they can't hold, on, hold jobs down. Um, same as autism, right? You have high flying CEOs that are on, have autism making tons of money. There are also people with autism who have 24 seven care and are housebound, yeah? Huge, huge variability in, uh, in what you're gonna see, how it's gonna present. You guys are probably gonna see more of your lovely high functioning <laughs> jumping, in the, <laughs> jumping on the beach. Um, so you can be very high functioning. Your gymnasts, your ballerinas, they're doing pretty good. Then you have, you can also have underneath the hypermobility spectrum disorders is your folks that they would just call them joint hypermobility syndrome. They're doing pretty good. They do not have a collagenous issue. Ehlers-Danlos is definitely an inherited collagenous collagen, collagen disorder, okay? They don't have great integrity. Um, you can click on the next. That's kind of <laughs> what their collagen looks like. There's issues in the um, alpha fibers of how the collagen comes together, okay? The cross bridges and binding of it. Not so great, so the integrity is just not doing so well, okay? So again, underneath that spectrum, if you have someone with EDS, there's definitely a collagenous thing going on. Um, so you have this low functioning, you guys are probably not gonna see these guys. I have the Baton score on here. Mainly, I wanted to 
bring the baby score up because hypermobility is becoming more popular and there's a lot of articles being written about it, the bait and score comes up a lot. They redid, revamped the whole diagnostic criteria for hypermobility in 2017. The bait and score used to be a little bit higher of a priority in diagnosis. Now the bait and score, we recognize it has its limitations. So that pre-puberty is pretty important, okay? So you can have someone put them through the bait and score, which is basically these five movements. You know, can you, oh, you'll see the people are pinky goes, um, right? Like I used to, my thumb used to go way down, but we are just like everybody else. We get a little more stiff as we age. So if you do a bait and score on someone 35 and above, they might not pop positive. They might not get a six. They might get a four or five. Um, and then it, even if you have like a 15 year old, maybe their, their laxity isn't in these joints that's tested in a bait and score. So it's not gonna, they're not gonna have a high score. Just know it's limitations, because everyone says, oh, just do this bait and score, and then you'll know. Like, no, <laughs> it's a little more complex uh, in terms of diagnosis. And we're not diagnosing it totally out of our scope anyhow, so. Um, but it's, it's good to just have the information if you want to. It's a, it's a good thing to go to. Um, and it gives you an idea of what's going on a little bit. Um, and the next slide. So outside, this is probably definitely more of the population that you're seeing if you're seeing high functioning folks. Um, and then there's two categories here. There was a, a woman who, she used to work at our gym. She worked, uh, she worked for Cirque du Soleil. She was basically in a position almost like this, but I was sitting like in the splits or doing some sort of movement. She goes, gosh, that looks so easy. I'm like, you were just doing that. What are you talking about? <laughs> but, what she had done, she actually was not genetic, genetically lax at all. She had pushed and grinded and pushed and pushed. And she was actually one of those ice skating Cirque du Soleil, like mm -hmm. the when they're on ice. Um, <laughs> Disney on ice. Um, so she did the ice skating, so like that position where that leg goes all the way up there, right? She can do that, but she just ranked, jank, like <laughs> pulled past all of her joint tissue to be able to do all of that. And she also had two uh, hip surgeries after <laughs> because mm -hmm. she just blew through everything. So I was saying to someone earlier about the, the I think I was saying to you, Brandon, this, this um, sort of value that we put on, on this, all this joint laxity. Everyone wants to do splits. Like, why are you doing it? What do you need it for? Like, <laughs> what's its purpose? Mm -hmm. I really don't do splits much at all anymore because I'm like, there's no reason for me to hold on to a split. Um, I could probably easily do it if I did five minutes of warm up. I could do it here because I have it genetically. Um, but I, why? Like, what is it giving me other than a pretty Instagram picture as you saw in the beginning? Um, <laughs> so you can have those people who are just, you know, you don't, like, if they want to do it, if they're getting money, a lot of these people are getting gigs in Cirque du Soleil, if they're making money off of it, if they want to take that chance. Yeah? My understanding of what the organization of collagen fibers is that directional load um, is what creates the organization. Yes. So in somebody that actually has like other dendros, or they say it, sorry. Um, yeah. Like if, does their collagen, is it capable of reorganizing into organized structures? Like something about the proteins that you were saying like don't bond correctly or like yeah. if you. It organizes as well as it can, right? Nice tissue, exactly. When you load it, Right, I have a scar here. If I sit here and keep doing this, it's yeah. finally gonna become, it's now disorganized tissue right now. Mm -hmm. If I push on it and push on it and do all my squats and move through it, then all the tissues will eventually line up. My tissues are gonna line up as well as they can, but as you saw in that last picture, they're just, they're not gonna be totally lined up perfectly. Like I could see somebody in a high room just kind of come in, like being a high spin hypermobile state, like, just not getting loads through stuff because it's so easy. You're just hanging on your ligaments and going through a new spot and like all these things. So you never get the load. Yes, input that's the other portion. It. Yeah, so, for sure. And then for I'm sure. sure you're gonna talk about training. Like yes, things, yeah, and we'll talk about that. Okay. But yeah, there's a lot of concepts. Like I always talk about when I, and it was on the airplane, like it's always the girl sitting next to me and the guy next to me, they just, you guys can just go back like this. And the tension in their tissues hold their neck there, and they can just fall asleep. And I'm like, oh. Because if I do that, I go like, and then, right, we're just a rag doll. There's no tension we have in our body whatsoever. Yeah, so it takes us longer, it takes more energy to create any sort of load, right? Someone will have load and tension just here. I have to go up to here to get any sort of pull 
on the tissue because all the tissue is just so lax. But is that different? Like when you're weight bearing and doing a squat, like you're through a weighted supported thing the whole way, do you not feel it? Like is your experience it's much harder feel to feel? Like, so your yeah. your interoception is not. Yeah. Like, right. Yeah. Like you're it's like right. Jen's gotten more flexible, but <laughs> I used to say, oh, to be, you know, to feel hypo-mobile, I'd have to do, you know, those age-old suits that, if you guys heard of this, from no. people who, no. to try to act old. Um. They put duct tape on you, they put uh. Vaseline on, on your goggles, they put corn in your feet so you can feel like oh, an old person, gosh. they put gloves on so you can't feel. Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's to experience, actually, they do it in airports. They okay. have people run through an airport with all this get up see the old people. to see how it feels to get through, like, huh. how do they feel? Let's stay active. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, so, right, for me, it's like, I would think, oh, yeah, if I put, you know, some duct tape on my joints, right? Like, oh, if I had somewhere to stop. And we'll talk about that in terms of training. You give people, wrap them in a hip-loaded, you know, right. a hip-loaded belt. Uh, like, feel, oh, there's my hip. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's holding together. And just load in itself just feels good to us. Those weighted blankets are actually <laughs> feel good for this population too, for double reasons. Um, so then there's also just the people that, they're just generally lax. Um, they're a little bit more like a collagenous person, but they just have laxity, but there's no collagen issue going on. Right. So they will load just like anybody else. Is hypermobility generally associated with weakness? Well, it's chicken or egg, okay. right? Yeah. Did the, because I actually have a theory that some of your more asymptomatic folks, are they asymptomatic because possibly they started ballet and gymnastics, what is common in those, very high load training all the time, every day, strength stuff mm -hmm. from a very young age. Did yeah. they actually make them, did they kind of bolster themselves up from that training and then became as asymptomatic? They're nice and strong mm -hmm. because of the training they did from a very early age. Do people get weak ba basically because of pain and they're just it's sort of less sort of, sort of um, a lot of you? They're no, kind of clumsy in their proprioception, uh, so then they don't go into any sports because they're sort of just like and then they don't get strong, right? It's chicken egg, right? Yeah, I guess Are I'm just curious about like the the ability to build strength if there's like a a trend that's been seen. They that. they can still build strength. Just takes a little longer. Okay. So there's a different, a few different reasons we'll talk about. Yeah, for sure. Um, so symptoms. What do these guys look like? These are obviously, right? Symptoms you would think. Sure. Dislocation, subluxations with joint laxity. We always think of just the joints, right? We just think the gumby. And they're actually starting to do a lot of these pictures. This one on the on your right is actually um, a picture of someone who's doing splits. So they're taking X-rays of people Ooh. when they're in the split position. Um, they're seeing that actually that it's called that backing sign that it actually the it has to yeah, ah, <laughs> has to pull out a little bit to go into a split. Okay. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> it popping every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's that's what that backing sign is. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, I'm you sorry, know. but it, it, a general person doing a split is. Evacuating the joint. Or In a general a person, person, I don't. I don't like. I think most of these guys. This one was dancers, but I'm not sure if they did the diagnosis, like flesh them out. Okay, these guys have EDS, or these guys yeah. don't. Um, but if I do a, a split on, on the opening up the joint like that, is that what that anatomy is saying to you? Yeah. And it's not, I mean, it looks humongous on this because, no, of, you know, it's an x-ray. Um, hmm. But it definitely happens. But it's also dependent on this picture. She actually, if you see the picture of her, um, like in the study, she actually, she's in super internal rotation. Mm -hmm. It depends on everybody's different anatomy. Mm -hmm. Some um, people's anatomy, the angle, that angle um, of the femur tends to be usually their, the ball is here that angle is pretty high to enable them to go way up into these positions, right? Mm -hmm. um, if they're here, bang, they're gonna bang into the bone. So they were looking, there's another one that looked at the morphology of dancers and how are they different. 
Um, there was a little bit of differences like that. That angle definitely, that neck angle shaft um, is, is usually just because it's a lot easier. <laughs> you don't hit into bone. So they definitely have, but they didn't see any correlation with pain, like that they, like the, the bony morphology, different bony morphology didn't necessarily create pain or injury. So, interesting study. They are doing more studies, but they're like 10 people, 20 people. <laughs> <laughs> and of nothing. Um, so it's a little hard. Uh, so the next one, these are the ones that are becoming more, people are becoming more aware of these symptoms, but it's still, like how many people here know about all of these different symptoms that come up with hypermobility? Okay. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> she knows all this stuff. So, what happens? Collagen, if we have a collagen disorder, collagen is everywhere. Uh, there's actually a vascular form of uh, EDS, but their mortality rate is not so good. Yes. Obviously. In their vascular system, that's how we stay alive. Um, so, but. Because it's everywhere, it's in our vascular system, it's in our vessels, so when blood goes through, our vessels kind of ooh, expand and they're a little slow to come back up, right? We were really silly when I, we as mammals came up on two legs, really rather silly. Everybody else is down here, yay! <laughs> you don't have to go against 10 meters per second of force and now I have to get it up, our computing system is all the way up, <laughs> five feet up. Come <laughs> seven feet up off the ground. That's really silly. So we've had we've created a lot of redundancies actually to keep our blood pressure up. We have little one-way valves in our in our uh, in our vessels. We also have our skeletal muscle pump. That's what we can we can help create um, or help strengthen to help push blood back up. Right. So if actually the Jesus on the Christ, random uh, tangent, but <laughs> right, crucifixion, you actually die from the, you're not able to get, create venous return because you can't push mm. against the ground to create your skeletal muscle pump. That makes sense. Uh, fun fact. Uh, so, <laughs> wow. so venous return is a good That's thing. A example. So we use our skeletal muscle pump, one way valves, but we also use vasoconstriction. How do we do that with adrenaline? Hmm, so we are pumping out a bunch of adrenaline to try to keep our blood pressure up. We also move around a lot. We, if you work with a lot of hypermobiles, I was at a yoga teacher training, all the hypermobiles were in the back. We were all moving around like this, sitting down. We tend to keep one leg up. We sit with our knees up to keep that blood pressure up and maintained because um, our blood pressure is always going down. It creates one of the brain fog symptoms. Because low blood pressure, we're pushing adrenaline out it's then gonna create that anxiety and panic disorder. You'll find some of these guys, they're already on, on an anti-anxiety. They didn't know, they just thought, oh, okay, I have anxiety disorder, but it might actually be coming from the hypermobility, okay? Um, and then all of these issues, if you go forward one, all these issues kind of feed on each other, right? You've got low BP, that creates a feeling of fatigue. You kind of get a brain fog, you're just sort of like, a little bit of a feeling of fatigue all the time. But you get that adrenaline, that creates poor sleep, also you know, factoring into fatigue. You have pain, we'll talk about pain, this is gonna be a little mini seminar on pain uh, in the middle of this. Um, they have a lot of pain, which creates poor sleep, which can also create fatigue. The muscular work, holding ourselves up, takes a lot more energy because we have no tension, so we have to use more muscle instead of uh, free energy of tension of ligaments and tendons, et cetera, right? Um, and then if you go back again, actually, so, and then these last two, the irritable bowel, some of these folks, they will again get diagnosed with IBS, but it's probably actually that they just have slow peristalsis, slow movement of the bolus of, of food going through your intestines. Um, it just creates a feeling of, of IBS and can create the SIBO, which is small bacterial, uh, intestinal, intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's just because stuff is moving slow. It sits in there longer, more bacteria, right? Um, so those are some of the things that can go on. So a lot of different symptoms. And there's like even, <laughs> this list goes even longer. It's a little crazy. But these are the ones that are the most common. Um, the anxiety and the BP, those are the ones that I find most, uh, that most of these guys, those are the most common. And just fatigue in general and pain. 
Hence the issue. Yeah. Why the onion? Oh, all the layers. Uh, layer on layer, right? It's just all these layers. Like, oh God, you got this? And ah, there's all this stuff that's happening, right? Layers upon layers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, so we talked about that. And then if you guys, you can just take a picture of this if you have anybody with BP stuff. These are different management things for low BP. Chris, you can uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think you have low BP? Those are the things that you can do. Okay. Lots of water, but actually don't drink just straight water because then you actually dilute everything and then you pee out more. So, fun fact: do not <laughs> do not over dilute your system with a ton of uh, <laughs> with a ton of water. Um, so you can just take a picture. And the the last two, those are more. You'd have to go to a doctor to get those. Those are prescription. Um, they just work on. Increasing pl plasma volume in the mitochondria just is worse than vaso vasoconstrictor. Yeah. Okay, so I said there was a small mini seminar on pain in this because, and I am slightly biased because I work with a lot of pain folks, um, and I get a lot of the people that are coming in sort of a little bit broken. Um, a l people like uh, Jen and I know a woman named Rose. She works a lot with contortionist circus folks. I don't think she works, I don't think she has a ton of people that are in much pain. They're doing pretty good, they're fine. Um, she can, so we'll, you can still use a lot of the training stuff that we talk about, but I think in general, all the things I'm gonna talk about pain with pain are, again, if you have a client that's in pain, you can use all these concepts. Um, has anybody taken any sort of pain seminar? I know you have, Jen. <laughs> Did you say, could you, the Noi group, or? I think it was like education when I was a personal trainer. Okay, yeah. So these guys, if you can see in the, middle, in the bottom there, uh, they all have great, uh, Greg Lehman has a great seminar. Mm. Mosley and Butler are from the Noi group, and I think, was O'Sullivan in the, uh, with them as he, well? He was at one but point. But he's not anymore. I don't know if he still is. Yeah. So they're with the Noi group. They actually now have classes in the US, which is great. Um, they're starting to do stuff here, they used to not, um, that middle one is David Butler, you can't see that. <laughs> and then Ben Cormick's putting out good stuff too. Yeah, Cormick and uh, Hargrove too, yeah. is his good one. And if there's any other. There's any other two I yeah. can think of off the top of yeah. my head. Okay, yeah, if you think of any others, just holler out. Uh, the main thing, my first initial consult with a lot of these people is just education, and it's usually on pain, because they come to me pretty broken. So I have to, I'm like, okay, we gotta, you gotta learn a little bit, you gotta get a little pain education. And they've also seen why the Noi group, Greg Lehman, all these guys, they have a workbook on pain because they've found that simply educating, just like, what, an hour or something, decreases on the scale, is it like a, it's like two or three, you know, going from like an eight to a five or something. They can be at a five, just educating them over an hour can bring them, or they can be at an eight and they can bring them down to a five, just by education. They're understanding, they're going, oh, this is how, okay. They can gain some agency, gain some power, gain, feel like, oh, I can do something about this, okay? Um, so just education, just talking to them can be helpful. Um, have some sympathy. Um, so, so um, this, is where, <laughs> this is where this is specific to this group. Uh, you have, I'm gonna talk a little bit about chronic pain and pain in general. With this population, I do find, with your normal folks, they'll be like, oh my god, I, you know, they, maybe they tore their ACL or have some back stuff. It's gonna be just that area that you're dealing with. These guys, are a little different. I call it the wandering gnome of pain because I had a client, she's like, you know, it's a Wednesday, there's a northerly wind, my ankle's hurting me. Like, out of blue, you, you're just walking up the steps, you're like, oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> so for half the day, you're dealing with a bummed up ankle. You have no idea why, and then, you, so you teach them a little bit about that, like, yeah, okay, you, that, those little things, just kind of, just let it go, just, it's gonna happen. Um, and hopefully those things, they will, they'll just pass in a day or two, um, and it'll be fine. On the worst case, it, that wandering gnome of pain sort of turns into this chronic state of pain, which then turns them into a sort of kinesic phobic state. That's where they're usually coming into me, and they look a little bit like flicker, <laughs> like that. Um, <laughs> So they turn into this, what they call is this catastrophizing state, mm -hmm. okay? Um, all the Debbie Downer type of stuff. Um, if you click, um, I have this actually slide, it's kind of randomly in here. 
the importance of language, just, David Butler is absolutely hysterical. Um, if you just, in YouTube, that treating the pain using the brain, it, it, it's brilliant on language and the power of language and, and being careful with your words when you're talking to these folks because they will come up and they'll say, I'm jacked up, I'm messed up. Uh, in Australia, they're like, I'm stuffed or something. <laughs> so different, different terms. Um, and those have an effect. They have like an effect on our brain and, and um, how we see ourselves and sort of they feed into that catastrophizing state. So mm -hmm. be, I'm always just saying, okay, it's, it's talking to you today. Let's see, let's see what's going on. Let's you know, see what's going on the rest of your life. Um, and then click the next. So they come to me in this catastrophizing state. So I'm gonna talk to them just about this pain basics. Now, does everyone hopefully know about this bio, you can kind of see it. The biopsychosocial -psycho model, okay? We used to believe in a pathoanatomic model when I was in school. That was, oh, it's broken, it hurts, let's fix that. We now know that pain is multifactorial. There are signals coming in from all sorts of directions. It's like a board of directors. All this information is coming in and they're gonna decide, oh yeah, that's, that hurt. <laughs> or they're gonna say, what, <laughs> well, I don't know, just party on. Um, so next slide. Okay, so. That whole big thing, tissue damage does not correlate to pain. That's like the huge big message nowadays. Is does that a soccer not correlate. player? Huh? Is that a soccer player? Yes, yeah, so. He's gonna run home. <laughs> <laughs> so with that biopsychosocial model, you get a boo-boo. How are you gonna react to that wound? Um, in that model, Scenario one, you've had no sleep. You've been eating donut, Snickers, and Coke for the last three days. <laughs> You're, you have 18 exams coming up, and you are playing soccer, and you missed the goal. You got that scratch. Clicky, clicky. Um, you're not going to be so sad. You're not going to be so happy. You are probably going to feel that wound on a, you know, on an 8 to 10. You're going to be like, ha, 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 killing me. Click. Scenario two. In this scenario, same exact wound we're looking at, right? You have been sleeping so well, eight to 10 hours a night. You've been eating all your veggies. You just went on a date last night. It was amazing. <laughs> You're at a game that, you know, the girlfriend, boyfriend sitting in the stands. They're screaming your name. You're doing amazing. You're gonna get that same wound. You are gonna be like, what, blood, there's blood on me? I don't, like, you do not, you, it's a zero. You don't even notice the wound, right? So that is, that is how pain, like, there are so many different factors. Just because you have tissue damage does not equate to actual pain, okay? That's huge with this population of saying, you can have damage or be told by a PT, you have degenerative this, you have broken this, that's messed up, jacked up. That's fine, we can, you can still, we can still get you to moving and getting out of pain, okay? Um, so that's just that huge, right? <laughs> <laughs> Instance. He's that not was gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good. I, sh I should have had a prize for that one. <laughs> okay. And it worked perfectly with the eye, uh, <laughs> the eye injury. So we have, in the worst case, right, with this population, sometimes they are unfortunately set, stuck in this chronic pain state. We have a lot of our physiology is dictating some of our behavior, right? With the hypermobile, a physiology of the, BP, of the low BP created that adrenaline in the system, made us all anxious. That's a behavior, a behavioral thing, right? And we think, oh man, she is totally all panicked and anxious and twitchy. That's a behavior, but it's happening because of the physiology that's going on inside. Does that make sense? Like it's not, we just think, oh, it's just an anxious Jane or whatever. <laughs> There's physiology going on underneath there, okay? So again, with, with chronic pain, having some sympathy because chronic pain creates changes in your brain, okay? Your amygdala, they've seen in, in folks with chronic pain, their amygdala, which does everyone know that amygdala is sort of where fear lives in your brain? It's where it process and it sort of ramps up, ramps up fear and vigilance. Um, where you're all scared, basically. <laughs> um, it, cre it makes this bigger, it increases it, which then just sort of 
kind of makes, just builds on the scared and chronic state and catastrophizing state that you're in. So it's just sort of feeding on itself, okay? Secondly, this is outside of our scope, but it's something that you can educate them on. It's called Adverse Childhood Experiences. Has anybody heard of this stuff? Nadine Burke Harris um, or any of, she is a, a doc that's in the Bay Area. She looked at, Dan, you can't see this so well. She looked at Folletti's work, which was in 98. She found, or Folletti found that actually, if you have any adverse childhood experiences, you know, all the traumas, the you know, abuse, trauma, divorce, drugs, alcohol abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, any of the horrible trauma, traumatic things that can happen to people when they are young, has a physiological effect. Some of them get stunted growth, immune issues, but it also affects them later in life. And uh, they can have higher rates of liver disease, heart disease, increased mortality rates, right? Dying younger. ACEs, is it called the ACEs studies out there? Um, yes, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. That's a very big, big, big study, right? Yes, yeah, yeah it was huge. thousands. It was a Kaiser, I think. Right. I think with Kaiser, yeah. Um, yeah, big, big study. Um, yeah, that was done in 98. But she wrote, her book was called The Deepest Well that she just wrote because uh, she was just seeing it in the baby district. That's where she was working. Uh, she was seeing this effect, huge effect, stunted growth. All these kids were having all these issues, uh, but they were also living with a lot of trauma. Um, is there a definition for chronic pain? Is it like a certain amount of time? It's beyond three? Three. Three months. Beyond three months. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So yeah. like, have they also done studies on like the changes in the brain if you get out of chronic pain? Like, what does the amygdala do then? Like, that's what the yeah. yeah that's that's the spoiler alert. Get to the point. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's plastic. Tell me how to do the splits. <laughs> <laughs> it's plastic. So yes, that is a spoiler <laughs> alert that we can change it back. With low um, back pain, they say that the <coughs> chronic state isn't until six months, though they do hmm. give That's a long time to be yeah. in pain. Leave it. What's that? Three to six That's months. That's a long time to be in pain with a back pain. Oh, a lot of my people, I get 10 years they've been yeah. in pain. Yeah, like sure. you, and you said you had a 10 year, and you have yeah. 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 crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Five, ten years, probably, they're in pain. More common than we think. I get them. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And they're they're really like, This is just normal. We all talk about it. You, you can kind of be like, oh, God, there's such a bond to be down or something. It's because of these things. So the, the that adverse job and experiences, they're sort of primed to actually become sort of chronic pain folks. Okay. Um, again, if you deal with your adverse childhood experiences, so you can just say to them, hey, there's this thing, it's a score, look it up, see what your score is, right? Out of our scope to know all the scary things that happen to them. But if, they, you know, if their score is high, they can then go and go get help, go to psychotherapy, somatic therapy, whatever they want to do to, to get, try to deal with all the trauma stuff and create some of the brain changes in the other direction. Um, and then there's also just this increased CNS sensitivity in certain people, right? We all have them where they, you have the folks who just any sort of, I have a client, even that vibrating roller, the hyper ice. Because, yeah. She did like that. She's just like, yeah. <laughs> she just, her, her system is just so sensitized. She's not hypermobile at all. She just happens to be one of these folks that has a super sensitized system. So all of those effects sort of create that catastrophizing little ballerina, okay? So it's just having that little bit of that sympathy and just knowing kind of what's going on with them. But then also, you can retrain your brain, right? They're plastic. We can change it, strip victims. They use like occipital lobe for hearing. I mean, it's right. Um, so you can do all sorts of things. And that will come from, I had this with one of my hypermobiles of, of so moments of success, right? They were, she was always going out and constantly getting injured and constantly being in pain. So then it's like, okay, now let's just give you, I just want you to go on a five minute walk. That's it, that's mm -hmm. all I want you to do. Okay, she goes on the five minutes, she's like, I feel good. And I gave her something, <laughs> she accomplished it, check. Sweet, good. Every single data point in her brain, mm -hmm. all those little sets of data points of success will then sort of start changing the, changing the pathways and changing the highways of where your brain, where your thoughts go um, in your brain. Start changing things. 
get you on to not being in a chronic pain state, okay? Um, uh, I think it was Tom Meyer that I just read. Most people, but many people don't have chronic pain, they just have recurring acute, acute pain. It's just, it's interesting to think of that, like, my hip didn't always hurt, but it kept hurting and hurting, you know, repeat repetitiveness. So I, I don't know what the distinction is necessarily, I don't recall, but well, it's it does a, give you hope. Well, there's yeah. also a lot of times, chronic pain often, it starts to not even be, there's nothing, there's no pathology going on. Right. So there's neuro tags. There's literally just, there's increased sensitivity in the area. There's nothing going on. It's all of this brain that's, that's just kind of increasing that. Do you have thoughts on that one? <laughs> no, no, that's a, yeah. yeah. And I think what, because I, you, you had a, didn't you, you had work done on your head, didn't you? A lot of work. Yeah. Because um, there, sometimes the physiological will be what you're saying, kind of this acute recurring pain. And I've seen that with, when it's a physiological pain issue. You know, someone's shoulder, it, legitimately has something massively going on, you know, it'll hurt, it'll feel a little better, so they'll think, okay, good, I'm going the right direction, then it'll hurt again, and it'll, you know, so it's sort of this volleyball yeah, sort of situation. So that's true, too. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm good. Good with Right, no, exactly. <laughs> so interesting, like, pain is weird. <laughs> that's a whole nother, yeah. yeah. Like, you so resensitize the whole area, just even with the smallest little bit. The lack of education on the part of supporting your tissues. Yeah. Like, so you're constantly trying to make your gnome look like this instead of like the wandering gnome of pain. <laughs> okay. Trying to you're just trying to bolster them, trying to get that resiliency up, trying to just keep them afloat, <laughs> get them out of that pain state. Okay. So that's what that's what a lot of the training, the way that I work with them, that's this is where I'm trying to get them moving so, more. So that's the grounded gnome. Of hope? Yes, grounded. <laughs> <laughs> there is my name. I gotta go change that. Peace frog. Peace frog. And then this, the, this is just a great one. If you, ha I show this actually to all my clients, not not just my hypermobile folks. Oh, yes, it's on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I have your Instagram <laughs> people. You all know that you've all seen things. this, okay? Um, and it's just it's key in just riding home. It was Virginia, I think, or something. I did a. Um, uh, which did the back one? Uh, in there. Yeah, the the, the, the disc degeneration. That was the, he did the, all the stuff on back, um, on the back. Little bit does a bunch of stuff on the shoulder. Um, but it just drives home Jeez. that you can have. I mean, if I took a scan of my shoulder right now, oh my god, a surgeon would be like, "Stop, get me OR right now." Um, <laughs> I probably have half a ligament holding on. Um, it's, it's just, but. It's mostly pain free. Um, so you can have all sorts of degeneration and stuff going on. And Lehman had the great, it's just graying on the inside, right? We accept gray hair as we age. We should accept that, yeah, stuff degenerates and that's totally normal and we can be fine. Um, so that's just huge. That's just a good one to show to anybody. And yeah, you can look on Adam, you can see it. You can just put scans on pain free people and it pops up on Google. <laughs> It's a good one to show people. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and anybody over the age of 35, maybe, is <laughs> what this is. Um, there's also, you have your catastrophizers, but there are also minimizers. I have some hypermobiles who are like that. And you all actually know some of these clients who can be at a 10. I had a woman, total straight face, just like, oh no, this is completely killing me, gone through the whole set. She also said she had four children with no epidural, no drugs. So I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> So that's some good pain tolerance. <laughs> so there are some folks who have a lot of pain tolerance, um, and you just, it's almost the opposite with these guys. I'm just always going, how are you feeling? How's that, how's it going? Is it good, is it good, is it good? <laughs> if they're at a five, they're actually probably at a seven. Just always checking in with them, because they can just ram through shit, like nobody's business. Um, so yeah, just a flesh wind. Um, and then there's some other ones, right? Um, so yeah, we're just trying to optimize pain tolerance. Okay, and these folks, and anybody really who has pain. Um, okay. Uh, and then the way that you do that, a lot of times, right, you, you want to, so say if you're Olympic athletes, right, we know that they, they are just religious, monk-like, with what they eat, everything they put in their body, measuring and saying, like, busting, 
sleep exactly the same all the time. They use like compression stuff. They totally manage their stress, breath work. So it's because breath is so big right now. <laughs> we have to keep alive. So Olympic athletes, you know, they manage this a ton to be doing Olympic feats, right? With anybody, so any of your folks, if you have people with chronic conditions, a lot of times they have to live like this just to, if you click it over, just for general life performance. This is, it can also get a lot of your chronic condition folks sort of a little bit down because they go out one night and they stay out till midnight or stay out till, stay out a little late, don't eat a little well, and they're kind of down for the count for maybe two or three days. Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's, just, it's frustrating. Because um, you have to be, and any of your, you know, your chronic fatigue folks or anybody with any sort of chronic condition, um, it can get, it's, it's, so that's when like some of those groups, and nowadays it's like so easy to join. There's a group for everything on Facebook and any of these social media. You can find a snicker eating group. I don't know. <laughs> There's so much stuff out there. Um, so that's a, a, a way to kind of sort of when you're feeling down, be like, okay, there's everybody else is out there doing the same thing I'm doing, just for just to get them to the first floor, they have to be pretty much managing all of this all the time. Um, but then I described that, well, that you can, that it helps with that pain tolerance, uh, helps with, then you can increase your fitness level, the fitness level will help your pain tolerance and all of it, hopefully steamrolls in the right direction, not in the bad direction, right? Okay. Um, 